Hello students, in this video we'll discuss the central limit theorem. If we're given a sequence of IID random variables x1, x2, xn goes on forever, then the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability that x1 plus x2 plus xn, so I add up the first n of those random variables, and I subtract off n times mu, where we'll say that mu is the mean of any one of those random variables, and divide it by the square root of n times the standard deviation of one of those variables. I can get the probability that this is less than or equal to a fixed value lambda. As n goes to infinity, this ratio goes to 1 over the square root of pi, the integral from negative infinity up to lambda, of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx, which is exactly just phi, the CDF of a standard normal random variable, evaluated at lambda. And so let's make a few notes about this, and this is, first, this is referred to as the central limit theorem. one of the most important results in probability. And so what does this say? Well, first we should note that the expected value of any one of them, of x1 is equal to the expected value of x2, etc. And these are all equal to the value mu. And then the variance of x1 is the variance of x2. They're all the same, and that's sigma squared. And so with these two observations, we can make the note that x1 plus x2 plus x n minus n mu. So n mu is the expected value of that random variable. So the numerator has an expected value of 0. And the variance of this is exactly equal to just the square root of n sigma. And so this whole expression over here has mean is equal to 0 and variance is equal to 1. So we standardize the mean and variance of this ratio on top. And so what we see over here is we get some sense of how this would be proven. What we can do is a special case of this. Think about a special case. It will help us understand the proof. A special case of this is that if mu is equal to 0 and sigma is equal to 1. Then, if we think about this, then we have x1 plus xn over the square root of n. Well, if we look at this random variable, the expected value of this random variable, well, let's think about it like this. If we take this random variable and call this random variable zn, which is going to be x1 plus xn over the square root of n, then this is n copies, x1 over root n plus xn over the square root of n. And what I can do is I can compute, if I get a sense of why the central limit theorem is true, I can compute the moment generating function of this zn random variable as a function of t. That will be what? Since I have the sum of independent random variables, it'll be the moment generating function of x1 over the square root of n at t. And we know that the linearity rule for the moment generating function says this is the moment generating function. And I'm going to have n copies of this, so that gets raised to the power n. It will be mx1 of t over the square root of n, all raised to the power of n. And so what we'd like to show is we'd like to show that the moment generating function, so now the claim is that the moment generating function of zn of t converges to the moment generating function of a normal 0, 1 random variable at t. And that would be equal to t e to the t squared over 2. And so what we can do to prove this result is we can take the logarithm of this and to compute the limit as n goes to infinity, and then use the fact that we have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 
1. So that is the methodology of the proof is that you consider the normalized sequence where you have mean 0 and variance 1, and you consider the moment generating functions of that expression, and you show, using L'Hopital's rule, that these moment generating functions converge. And if the moment generating functions converge, then the cumulative distribution functions will converge as well. So the moment generating function convergence, so moment GF convergence, will imply convergence and distribution. So the central limit theorem shows the true power of the moment generating function method because when you're summing independent random variables, you have a product structure for the moment generating functions. And that implies that a logarithm will change the scale of the problem in understanding how the variance comes into play. Thank you very much.